spirit of life, spirit who led us to dream up a Hermes, a, a Mercury to the Romans, of the winged feet of communication, the patron of mail and floral delivery services, spirit who inspired the imagination of those who created the miracle of language, of writing systems, and the myriad creations and inventions that enable our connections across space and time. Spirit, help us through the painful parts of our brief and delicate lives. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and all senses to know the solace of being part of something far greater than our individual selves. Lead and inspire us to act, to love, cherish, and protect our world and our neighbor creatures, flora, fauna, two, four, six, and eight-legged, winged and petaled, fruited and spored, shelled, tusked and antennaed, branched and leaved, and especially one another. Bless the wanderers, help us in the caravan to not despair. Help us to honor the holy in the space between us. Give us courage and energy to act within our spheres of motion and to support the efforts of those who cannot succeed alone. Be with us in our becoming. In honor of the ancestors, in honor of the mysteries that pass our understanding, we will have two minutes filled with quiet. Dear readers, dear listeners, dear writers who ever put pen to paper and stamp to envelope, this is a love letter to letters and an invitation to join me in going against the grain of our times by writing letters or postcards in the season ahead. Write to someone you miss. Write to someone going through a hard time. Write to someone who might not know how much they mean to you or to a novelist or journalist you read whose work trigger the response. Write to the person who has a little free library in their front yard where you found the book you hadn't known you needed to read, or to the gardener in your neighborhood whose blossoms cheered you up. I made a resolution this year to support the United States Postal Service by reviving my old letter writing habit and hoping that receiving a letter from me would inspire my near or distant friends to write back. In recent weeks, gathering my postal and epistolary thoughts and cataloging my experiences, I remembered the tour I had as a brownie 
a second grader in Carmel, California. A postal worker took our troop of little girls behind the scenes at the post office. The details are hazy, but the awesomeness of being on the other side of the border that separates workers who belong in those mysterious precincts from the uninitiated felt thrilling to me. And as a child, and maybe even still, I had a fascination for the choreography of adults creating the organized world. So I called our post office, hoping to speak with someone who might be able to tell me who might have authority to grant me a tour. It was a Friday afternoon, so I was not surprised when my call got diverted to a call center. A call center staffer named Cynthia asked how she could help, expecting me, I imagine, to voice a complaint. I said that I loved the postal system and was doing some research and wondered about the possibility of a tour. She took my information and said she would look into it. I asked her where she was located and how she came to be in her position. The Midwest is all I'm allowed to say, she said. I was a mail carrier for 23 years until an injury ended that part of my career. I loved it, especially in winter when the dogs weren't out. It's just you rocking. I love the people. You can tell a lot about what's going on by the mail you deliver. We see people sad times, but I stay professional, nothing personal. Circulars, ugh, they made the work backbreaking. It got so I could only carry the mail for a few houses at a time. I started in 1986 and I'm gonna work until I get my pension. Connecting with Cynthia confirmed my fantasy about the pleasures there once might have been in the days when mail included personal correspondence and few bills or circulars. People paid by cash or check, they didn't live on credit. Our postmaster is protected by many gatekeepers and it may be that in our complicated times, behind the scenes tours of the post office in the spirit of appreciation and curiosity are a greater risk than our couriers can bear. After a few weeks of intermittent efforts, I gave up on trying to see behind the scenes at the post office in time for this day. Consider the extraordinary event that mail is. Picture the blue green marble that is our planet, 24,901 miles around. Reflect for a moment on the fact that a tissue thin blue aerogram weighing a tenth of an ounce folded to become its own envelope will, with a few marks and one small stamp, travel from your front door to the front desk of a hostel on an island in the Pearl River Delta near Canton, where I once received a lot of mail. This is so unlikely. And when I'm in the right mood, this is as miraculous as people shooting themselves into space via rocket ships. I dread the thought that the conveniences of our age, the possibilities and inevitabilities of electronic communications will do away with the practice of letter writing as these advances already threaten the persistence of cursor writing and ink pens. My first letters were of course, the letters to Santa and the tooth fairy. I remember trying to charm Santa with my thoughtfulness about the snacks we left for him and his reindeer. These were followed by the thank you notes mom trained us to send to the grandparents and godparents who remembered our birthdays and Christmas with gifts or checks. I was perfunctory with these. If my letters to Santa and the Tooth Fairy were instrumental, letting them know what I wanted or buttering them up in hopes that they would use whatever free reign they had to treat me extra nicely, then the thank you notes were written later in that cycle of interested exchange. You give me a gift, I give you credit for that with my written expression of gratitude. The circle is closed until the next year. Functional, instrumental, conventional. My mother, Jane Young Hans, whose name was recently spoken here every month for 12 months after she died in February, 2020, modeled a different kind of letter writing to me. Mom would write to those grandparents and others to catch them up on how we were and what our life was like in whatever new habitat we had adapted to as we accompanied my naval officer father, Peter, to whatever duty station the U.S. Navy ordered him to, as would happen typically every two years. 
Every two years, we would uproot and replant, reestablish in another seacoast town, East Coast, West Coast, then Italy, then Iran, where Tehran wasn't on the seacoast, but at the time, but at the time there was a mission for the US Navy there that I was only dimly aware of, then Greece. Distance created the need for letter writing. There may not have been if we had not been so very far away. Long distance phone calls were expensive and were rarely in the budget for our young family. Mom would describe the dailiness of her life, the characters of her world, the kids say the darndest things, anecdotes that would amuse the grandparents, circulate to other family members, and stick to us for years to come. It strikes me as a sad thing to raise your children far from family. Sad that grandparents don't experience the pleasure of their grandchildren close up. Sad that the generations don't know each other intimately. But my mother's letters and those she received from her mother and sisters went a long way toward cultivating, nurturing, and enacting family. My mother's relationship tending work anchored my sisters and me in our wider family. We knew we belonged to these people. We knew stories about them, their letter writing voices and conventions. My mother's sister, Frances, loved describing meals, particularly desserts, as well as the fish Uncle Larry caught and grilled. Grandmother Mimi, who as a girl in a small South Carolina town, aspired to be a journalist, wrote with wit and pungency about family doings with the flair of a writer covering the culture and society beat. Mimi wrote with a Bakelite tortoise shell fountain pen that she filled with emerald green ink. I can easily conjure in my mind's eye the handwriting of all four grandparents and a number of aunts and uncles and great aunts. My mother's distinctive hand still arrests me. And here I want to pause to reflect on the letters we use, the ABCs we write to compose our epistles. These slides are a lineage of letters. ABCs and envelopes. Anna, please show the slides now. When I was a teenager, I got interested in calligraphy. This first slide shows a page from the Operina, the little work of Arrighi, whose 16th century text is the origin of the chancery cursive I learned in the 20th century, studying with Rufan Petrie, whose handwriting is here. She was a friend of my mother, and her elegant, this elegant card is something I've carried around for me since, with me since 1977 as sort of a talisman. Next slide. Um, this is the hand of my grandmother, envelopes my grandmother Mimi from times when postage was four stamps and before we knew the discipline of zip codes. Next slide. This is my mother's hand in my sister's birth announcement, um, written just 48 hours after the birth of that little sister. Next. And here is my sister who inherited the green ink habit from my grandmother who also studied she, my sister, also studied calligraphy, and you can see her fancy green writing. Next. And this is my mother's writing, um, writing to me and my daughter and my daughter's boyfriend, uh, which I just love that she already sort of knew me to be part of our family. Next. These are um, acknowledgments of condolences that we received after the, after the death of my mother. Next. And these are um, programs and materials sent to friends of my mother who could not attend her funeral. It's such a consolation for me to um, continue the experience of remembering her in this way. Next. And these are letters sent to um, potential voters in Georgia, arranged um, here from First Parish, which, and I, I wondered what the effect of handwriting, the personalness, and the attempt at kind of beauty and interestingness might have on the people who receive these cards. Next. And this is just a smorgasbord of uh, postcards I've received from folks over the years to my various addresses with some stamps I liked and handwritings I liked and messages I liked. Next. 
And here are some um, handwriting from some of my Chinese pen pals. And what I particularly like is that the convention of putting a stamp in the upper right-hand corner uh, had not yet arrived to China. And you can see stamps pasted every which way here. And you can also see the variety in, um, in, in rhythm and force and confidence in people's writing. There's one more of these. Next, please. Thank you, that's it. Mom kept the witty, jokey, edgy gift and card industry in business. She was an inveterate gift giver and card sender, even or especially with friends who lived nearby, who she saw on a regular basis. In this way, she modeled male communication for pleasure and fun, and more deeply, I think, to show love and affection and a certain kind of belonging to a friend group who joked their way through their lives as wives and mothers and docents, laughing at lives' absurdities. This is writing as echolocation, most well known as a practice of bats and whales through which they send sound signals of whales, whistles, clicks and groans, bats, high-pitched squeaks and chirps out into the air or their watery matrix so they can navigate, hunt, identify friends and enemies and avoid obstacles. My mother echolocated through letters to maintain her bearings, to let those who cared about her and us know about our days. In 1976, my father departed our home in Naples, Italy, where we lived for four years, which was the longest I'd lived anywhere up until that point for his next duty station in Tehran, Iran, leaving my mother and two self-absorbed teenage daughters and our not quite five-year-old sister, Jamie, to graduate from high school and tie up the loose ends of our wonderful Fellini movie years. My mother appears to have written to my father almost every day during that five-ish month long separation. And this year, my father has developed a practice of transcribing these letters. He types up her words and inserts his own annotations and editorial comments. And then via email, he sends one out every Sunday evening to about 14 of us in folk. My poor mother, she was juggling so many responsibilities and administrative details with various birthdays, graduations, pneumonias, tours, car repairs, overseas shipments, shopping for Italian pottery that my father's new boss in Milan asked that she get for him since it could then be conveniently added to the crates of our household effects to be shipped to our new home in the desert. The bureaucratic dimensions of dismantling our home, tracking finances and reimbursables, scheduling the inspections related to terminating services and utilities, all while my sister Trini and I were totally absorbed in our exciting teenage girl lives. Through this practice, my father communes with her storytelling voice. He feels her moods of discouragement when Jamie is sick and it's my graduation, and her triumph when problems are solved, when friends step in to support us in what was really a very challenging time. He summons her spirit and energy and a time that has precipitated out in memory as among the best years of our family's life. It is an echolocation he is doing, navigating his new life alone in the presence of her memory, made vivid through her words describing her dailiness. In this way, he manifests something Proustian in search of lost time. The fact of these letters makes this possible. These letters revive memories and capture an energy, a chi, that was animating my mother as she wrote and came also from a moment and an environment long ago and far away. There's something mystical and metaphysical to me in this. My friend writes that of the endorphins he imagines released in my dad to remember this way. He belonged to her, she was awesome, and he was proof. I have never been a faithful journal keeper or diarist. What another might have written in a journal or diary, I've always preferred to write in a letter in hopes of generating a dialogue. I've long thought of my letter life as echolocation, giving me bearings, letting my conversation partners know something about where I am, 
physically or metaphysically in the world or in my head and heart or both. The historian Joseph Ellis, in a preface to the letters of Abigail and John Adams notes, quote, letter writing in the late 18th century was a more deliberative process, less an exchange of information than an exchange of personae, more a crafted verbal composition than a merely factual memorandum. Both time and space were experienced differently back then, with the former feeling more leisurely than now, and the latter regarded as a more formidable obstacle that delayed reception of your words and thoughts for weeks or months." In 1994-95, when I was writing my dissertation and soaking in theories and histories of the world system and theories of how we know what we know and deconstructions of all of those, I began most mornings with a cup of coffee and the shriek of the dial-up modem. Eventually the connection would occur and I would find a letter, an email letter from a sister or a friend. I recently found a collection of exchanges with two close confidants from that time. These exchanges are like flies in amber. I would describe my mood, the sensory dimensions, any carryovers of stress or pleasure from the day before, my dreams, I would unload and in that unloading self soothe, grope for clarity, assuage my loneliness and insecurity and imposter syndrome. I was echo locating for survival, sending something out there and feeling such fulfillment when something would come back, even more so when what came back was a thoughtful response to what I had sent out. As this habit was taking hold, I remember pondering the question of these different mediums emailing with a friend, writing snail mail to a friend, or walking and talking with a friend, how they compared. Would the same dialogue emerge? Was one better than the other? I'm still pondering that question, and in truth, I love them all. I've known each to buoy me up and to deepen my experience of my place and moment in our shared predicament, which feels like wisdom. But for today, my favorite child is the written letter that carries traces of the moment as a physical artifact, a drip of coffee or juice or wine on the page. I was walking in Mount Auburn Cemetery a few months ago with a friend from this congregation during the tour that pointed out key figures from Black history buried there. Walking among the tombstones, he commented that he had only really known the name and dates of his ancestor who had immigrated here from Russia until recently discovering that man's letters. And what a revelation it was to have a sense of his humor, his vitality and aliveness through the words of the letters he wrote. That feeling is amazing. That feels amazing to me. That ability to feel the living spirit of the ancestor through words written by his hand where once there was only the information of a tombstone, names and dates. Joseph Ellis cited the different experience of space and time to set the context of John and Abigail's letters in the 18th century. I continue to feel a deep and mysterious, call it sacred space that sometimes opens up and reveals itself to me when I fully attend to letter writing. Echo location with folks who make up my community of friends, kin and fellow travelers across time and across space gives me an experience of connection to the net from which we cannot fall. And in this experience, I recognize what others have described as prayer. Try it. Send a love letter today to someone you are grateful for, or send a message in a bottle, or whatever its current day equivalent might be, to an unknown recipient. It might make you immortal. Thank you.